Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Medal of Honor induction ceremony in honor of Staff Sergeant David G. Bellavia. Staff Sergeant Bellavia was presented our nation's highest and most prestigious award for valor by the President of the United States, the Medal of Honor. This afternoon, he will formally be inducted into the Pentagon's most sacred place, the Hall of Heroes. Our hosts for today's ceremony are performing the duties of the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable David L. Norquist, performing the duties of the Secretary of the Army, the Honorable Ryan D. McCarthy, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General James C. McConville, and the Sergeant Major of the Army, Daniel L. Daly. Ladies and gentlemen, Please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Staff Sergeant Adiza Jabril and the invocation delivered by Chaplain Thomas Soljam. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched with so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner Or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me as we mark this special occasion in prayer. Lord, you call warriors to be strong and very courageous, and you promise to go with them wherever that path may lead. We thank you today for one such warrior, Staff Sergeant David Bolivia, whose love for fellow soldiers has brought out this courageous spirit in the actions that we honor in this ceremony. I thank you for his faith, family, friends, and comrades that have forged this humble warrior who stands before us today. It is with a profound sense of pride that a grateful nation recognizes the valor of your servant David. He joins the pantheon of heroes who have gone before and is a waypoint for those who will follow. Bless him, our nation, and our army with men and women of like character, courage, and commitment for many years to come. And Lord, keep the liberty's lamp burning bright, always I pray in your holy name, amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, General McConville. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome Representative Collins, Secretary Norquist, Secretary McCarthy, Sergeant Major, and Holly Daly, and all of our distinguished guests. Thank you for being here today. You know, there are some people who look for their heroes at sporting events. There's others who look for them on golf courses, and even others who look for them at concert halls. My heroes are soldiers, soldiers who raised their right hand and said, send me, knowing that they would be going into harm's way. Soldiers like Staff Sergeant David Bellavia, who went above and beyond the call of duties. Very hard. And as we honor David today, I want to recognize his family, his wife, Deanna, his children, Evan, 
Aidan, and Vivian, his mother, Marilyn. His brothers ran and Reverend Daniel, and I met them Monday night, and what, what a wonderful family. Thank you for being here and supporting David. I know this is kind of a challenging week, but it's, it's very, very special to have you here. Yesterday with the official award of the Medal of Honor at the White House, David Bellavia joined his distinguished group of national heroes who displayed conspicuous gallantry above the call of duty and under extraordinary circumstances. We're honored to have one other Medal of Honor recipient with us today, and that's Specialist 5, Jim McLuhan. Sir, could you please stand so we could acknowledge you? <laughs> Sir, it's great to have you here. Thank you. I'd also like to recognize uh, some of the members of the platoon who served well, so well with David. Could the soldiers of Task Force 22 stand up, please, and be recognized? Great job, guys. We just had a great lunch with you all. So. Uh, thank, thank you for making us so proud. And I, and I also know we have some Gold Star family members here. We can never forget the loss of our loved ones. Could you please stand and allow us to recognize you? The Battle of Fallujah, led by the Marines, was truly a team effort. It was multinational, it was multi service, it was multi branch, and it was multi division. Forces came from all across Iraq to defeat the terrorist and insurgent threat in Fallujah. One of those units was 2 2 Infantry. 2 2 Infantry would be the main effort battalion for the 7th Marine Regiment as they attacked into sector. And although there were plenty of jets, fighters and attack helicopters and fire support, this battle was won on the ground by the troops, and those, some of those troops are here today. This was won by the troops on the ground. And it was won by soldiers and Marines in close, tough combat. And again, it's great to have you all here today so we can recognize you for all of your heroism and what you did to represent this country so well. During the Second Battle of Fallujah, David was a squad leader in Alpha Company, 2nd Battalion, 2nd Infantry Regiment. And on that 10th day in November 2004, he was leading his squad, conducting search and attack operations moving south through Fallujah. The squad had been engaged by small arms, RPG fires and IDs for 48 hours straight, clearing sectors as they moved. Their mission that night was to clear a block of 12 buildings where about six or more insurgents were thought to be taken shelter and dug in. A squad from his platoon entered to clear a building, and they were gauged by heavy enemy fire. They took casualties and were trapped inside. David recognized the danger and took immediate action. He exchanged his M16 for a second M249 squad automatic weapon and aggressively moved into the house. He laid intense fire on the insurgents which allowed the squad to exit. Next, a Bradley fighting vehicle fired into the house to suppress the insurgents. Not, know how, not knowing how many insurgents were still alive, David certainly re-entered with his M16. He knew he had to destroy the enemy to protect his soldiers, and that's exactly what he did. In the chaos, uncertainty, and intense close quarters combat, David acted on his fearless determination and instincts he ultimately eliminated five insurgents. His actions that day saved an entire squad, cleared an insurgent strong point, and saved members of his platoon from an imminent threat. That day also happened to be David's 29th birthday. David, your actions on that November day, at the risk of your own life, were well above and beyond the call of duty. Your actions inspire us and will continue to inspire future generations of Americans. 
Thanks for representing the best of America and the best of the Army well. I'm honored that you are a soldier for life. Thank you all for being here today, and I'd like to introduce Secretary McCarthy. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us here today. This is a long overdue recognition. First, let me w welcome all of our distinguished guests, Medal of Honor recipient, that are also in attendance today. A special welcome to David's mother, Marilyn, his wife, Deanna, his children, Evan, Aiden, and Vivian, and his brothers, Daniel and Rand. It's great to have you all here with us today. I'd also like to recognize the Gold Star families in attendance, as well as all of David's battle buddies from 2-2 Infantry, the Ramrods who joined us for this incredible recognition. We're here today to honor Staff Sergeant David Villavilla, whose actions on November 10th, 2004, are fully deserving of the nation's highest, most prestigious military decoration, awarded for acts of valor. David, it's truly a privilege for me to be a part of this ceremony as we induct you into the Hall of Heroes. Today, David joins a select group who have demonstrated the willingness to go above and beyond the call of duty when the nation and the teammates needed the most. We're proud and humbled to have a soldier of this stature among our ranks. David's heroic actions on night, that night in Fallujah, as just recounted by General McConville, leave no doubt that there are heroes who walk among us. I had the pleasure of speaking to David over the last few days, and along with his incredible candor and wit, it is evident that his commitment to the Army and his brothers in arms remains unwavering. In our discussion, he said to me, this honor is not for me, it's for them. It's for all of the Iraq War veterans, which is why it's no surprise when you brought your teammates on stage with you and the president yesterday. In David's case, he credits much of that drive to his grandfather, Joseph Brunaccini. As a member of our greatest generation, Joe participated in the Normandy campaign as a part of the follow-on forces that poured into France after the D-Day invasion. He fought through the thick Bocage country and took part in the Battle of the Bulge. When David was a boy, Joe would tell him stories about his time in the war. He would describe his experiences as a radio telephone operator and brag about those in which he served with. As David remembers, Joe's stories never glamorized death, but instead were focused on saving people. They were always about the bonds that formed between soldiers and the camaraderie of Army units. It was these stories that inspired David to serve. Today, Joe is 99 years young. And joining us, uh, for, I think, via live stream, uh, but is at home well and resting in New York. He will rest assured to know that his grandson is carrying on that tradition of the greatest generation. David's commitment to his Army family did not end once he left the force in 2005. In 2005, he co-founded Vets for Freedom, a veteran democracy organization that empowers veterans of character and experience with opp opportunities to represent the nation and be a part of the national dialogue. In 2012, he went on to become a radio talk show host in his hometown of Buffalo. He wanted America to know the challenges that soldiers face in the world and the sacrifices that they endure. His, country, his, co, his show currently ranks the top 100 shows in America, but it doesn't end there. After writing a book about his experience as a soldier and working closely with countless veteran organizations, his desire to serve knows no boundaries. I'm sure this does not come as a surprise to anyone but David let me know that he wanted to find another way to serve the Army. He wants to help Army with recruiting by sharing his story and how it prepared him for life, which has made him a better person, father, and man. This is exactly what retired Sergeant First Class Gus Reyna did when he recruited a young David in 1999. Gus was in attendance yesterday at the White House, but unfortunately he had to head back to work. It is clear that someone with such an eye for talent needs to be back on active duty. <laughs> so, Sergeant Major Daly, I want you to take this for action and uh, go find Gus and get him back in our ranks as quickly as possible. Um, we're a people organization, and it's clear that people like Gus helped us find the best that America has to offer. David, it's a privilege for me to stand alongside you and be a part of this ceremony. You truly exemplify what's great about this country and our army. 
your commitment to our country, to your brothers in arms, is a lasting example that will inspire generations to come. Thank you for all you've done for us and for our country. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Mr. David Norquist, an outstanding dedicated civil servant who has served several presidents. And last week, President Trump announced his intent to nominate him as our 34th Deputy Secretary of Defense. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Norquist. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends and family, welcome and thank you for being here today to welcome Staff Sergeant David Bellavia to his rightful place in the Hall of Heroes. Sergeant Bellavia is the first living recipient of the Medal of Honor for actions taken during our Operation Iraqi Freedom. I want to offer a special welcome to David's mother, Marilyn, wife, Deanna, children, Evan, Aidan, and Vivian, and brothers, Daniel and Rand as well as the Gold Star families in attendance and the many soldiers who served alongside David who are here today. It is an honor to be here with all of you today. Thank you for the service and thank you for the sacrifice you have made for our nation. Today is special because today we reflect on the true meaning of courage, service, and selflessness and honor a rare person who embodies them. There are many valorous stories of combat, but the Medal of Honor is unique. It is only awarded to the bravest among us, the noble and the selfless. Staff Sergeant Bellavia is one of them. We may use the hero, term hero all the time, but there are in fact heroes among our heroes and they are very rare. Since the Medal of Honor's creation in 1861, of the tens of millions who have served in the U.S. military, less than 3,600 medals have been awarded, each after painstaking deliberation and consideration. These are people who, when presented with the option, were willing to sacrifice themselves to protect others. This award, is about offering these special souls our reverence as a nation and as a military, and ensuring that the best among us, their bravery, their sacrifice, and their selflessness is never forgotten. Now, where does that courage and selflessness come from? We often ask ourselves. It comes from their commitment to others and to the mission. For Staff Sergeant Bellavia, the son of a dentist from Jamestown, New York, and the youngest of four boys who grew up in Western New York, the desire to serve and protect those he loves runs deep and drove him to join the military after studying biology and theater at Franklin Pierce and the University of Buffalo. When asked about his inspiration for joining the Army, he points to the example set by his grandfather, who earned a bronze star while serving in the Army during the Normandy campaign. Staff Sergeant Bellavia continued with the tradition of joining the U.S. Army Infantry. He would eventually deploy to Iraq with Alpha Company Task Force 2-2 Infantry out of the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One. On November 10, 2004 in Fallujah, when his unit walked into an ambush, not only did David put himself at risk to give others the opportunity to exit the house, he chose to go back in and for half an hour fighting the remaining insurgents still inside. I had the honor and privilege of spending a little bit of time with David and his teammates, and I can tell you they are truly a band of brothers. The camaraderie of these men and the humility with which David approaches his heroic actions is inspiring. It comes at no surprise that he acted bravely and decisively to protect his fellow soldiers. That's what serving is all about, David says. It's all about the mission, quote, we're not looking for attention. We're here because our country needs us to be. When asked about his actions that day in Fallujah, David said, I'm not the best shot, but at five feet, I'm pretty good. <laughs> I'd say so. David would also ask us to push the spotlight from himself back to his unit. So David, consistent with that, let me highlight for the audience that the hero heroism displayed during the course of the Battle of Fallujah 
earn Task Force 2-2 the Presidential Unit Citation. So David and his fellow soldiers here today come from a task force of heroes, and we honor them. Now David's willingness to sacrifice himself to protect those around him is fundamental to why we are all here, to protect each other and to protect our nation. We may spend a lot of time talking about weapon systems, technology, and doctrine, but our most important asset is the individual soldier, sailor, airman, and marine, because at the point where the rubber meets the road, it all comes down to those individual men and women, their bravery, courage, professionalism, sense of duty, and selflessness, all of which were so remarkably exhibited by this great American. War has always been a human endeavor, and it is people like David who give us faith in our future. His actions resonate across time and space, inspiring us and fortifying our trust in ourselves, in our humanity, in our military, and in our nation. Our country is forever indebted to him, and this medal reflects the American people's understanding of a certain paradox. We only become truly great when we make ourselves the servants of others. David is a truly great man, and this nation is proud to call him one of our own. Thank you. Mr. McCarthy, General McConville, Sergeant Major of the Army Daily, and Staff Sergeant Bellavia will now join Mr. Norquist on stage for the induction ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated during the presentations. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3, 1863, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Staff Sergeant David G. Bellavia, United States Army, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Staff Sergeant David G. Bellavia distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty on November 10, 2004, while serving as a squad leader in support of Operation Phantom Fury in Fallujah, Iraq. While clearing a house, a squad from Staff Sergeant Bellavia's platoon became trapped within a room by intense enemy fire coming from a fortified position under the stairs leading to the second floor. Recognizing the immediate severity of the situation and with disregard for his own safety, Staff Sergeant Bellavia took up an automatic weapon and entered the doorway of the house to engage the insurgents. With enemy rounds impacting around him, Staff Sergeant Bellavia fired at the enemy position at a cyclic rate, providing covering fire that allowed the squad to break contact and exit the house. A Bradley fighting vehicle was brought forward to suppress the enemy. However, due to high walls surrounding the house, it could not fire directly at the enemy position. Staff Sergeant Bellavia then re-entered the house and again came under intense enemy fire. He observed an enemy insurgent preparing to fire a rocket-propelled grenade at his platoon. Recognizing the grave danger posed by the grenade to his fellow soldiers, Staff Sergeant Bellavia assaulted the enemy position, killing one insurgent and wounding another who ran to another part of the house. Staff Sergeant Bellavia, realizing he had an uncleared, darkened room to his back, moved to clear it. As he entered, an insurgent came down the stairs firing at him. Simultaneously, the previously wounded insurgent re-emerged and also engaged Staff Sergeant Bellavia. Staff Sergeant Bellavia, entering further into the darkened room, returned fire and eliminated both insurgents. Staff Sergeant Bellavia then received enemy fire from an insurgent emerging from a closet in the room. Exchanging gunfire, Staff Sergeant Bellavia pursued the enemy up the stairs and eliminated him. Now on the second floor, Staff Sergeant Bellavia moved to a door that opened onto the roof. At this point, a fifth insurgent leapt from the third floor roof onto the second floor roof. 
Staff Sergeant Bellavia engaged the insurgent through a window, wounding him in the back and legs and causing him to fall off the roof. Acting on instinct to save the members of his platoon from an imminent threat, Staff Sergeant Bellavia ultimately cleared an entire enemy-filled house, destroyed four insurgents, and badly wounded a fifth. Staff Sergeant Bellavia's bravery, complete disregard for his own safety, and unselfish and courageous actions are in keeping with the finest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself and the United States Army. At this time, the Medal of Honor flag will be presented. On 23 October 2002, Public Law 107-248, Section 8143, established the Medal of Honor flag to recognize service members who have distinguished themselves by gallantry in action above and beyond the call of duty. The Medal of Honor flag commemorates the sacrifice and bloodshed for our freedoms and gives emphasis to the Medal of Honor being the highest award for valor by an individual serving in the armed forces of the United States. The light blue color with gold fringe bearing 13 white stars are adapted from the Medal of Honor ribbon. The Medal of Honor plaque will now be unveiled, inducting Staff Sergeant Bellavia into the Hall of Heroes. Thank you, Mr. Norquist, Mr. McCarthy, General McConville, and Sergeant Major Daly. Ladies and gentlemen, Staff Sergeant David G. Bellavia. Good afternoon. The Honorable David Norquist performing the duties of Deputy Secretary of Defense. The Honorable Ryan McCarthy performing the duties of Secretary of the Army. Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General James McConville. Sergeant Major of the Army, Daniel Daly, and my Congressman, the Honorable Chris Collins, U.S. Representative of New York, from New York, Ramrods of 2-2 Infantry. There we go. Uh, family, my mother, my brothers, Dan, Rand, Tim, Deanna, my kids, Evan, Aiden, and Vivian. Thank you for your support. Your presence and my good fortune to be able to share this occasion with my men, my family, my friends has eased the awkwardness that I'm feeling right now. What's more, I'm especially proud of the recognition that this award brings to my unit, my leaders, and my peers of the mighty ramrods of 2-2 Infantry, 3rd Brigade, 1st Infantry Division. Combatants bear witness to all aspects of the human condition. It reveals the darkest parts of the human soul while residing side by side with the most exalted characteristics, nobility, honor, valor, and God's grace. Why do American warriors under fire do what men have done since this nation's inception? This is a common thread that connects the militias of Lexington and Concord with the warriors of Fallujah. It is our love of nation, our way of life, and our love by those who we serve with side by side. We defend, 
we avenge, we sacrifice, we bleed, and we are willing to die for this unique creation, the United States of America. I am complete for having experienced that kind of sacrifice with my fellow men at arms. And those who died, they gave their lives for me. They gave their lives for you and countless citizens who will never know them. I'm talking about Sims, Falkenberg, Iwan, Gonzalez, Vandenberg, Madison, Geriantis, Shrek, Sizemore, Mock, Rosales, Cardenas, Sprayberry, and Pruitt. Those were our countrymen. Those were our friends. And these men will never get the chance to experience the cycle of life, the birth and growth of their children. They shall not grow old because they chose to stand in our place and face the enemy for us. It's not enough to acknowledge the fallen by name or just inscribe their names in marble as proof that they lived and died. To truly honor the fallen, we must acknowledge how and why they gave their lives. Their death wasn't a random act or a splash of misfortune. These men and women voluntarily put themselves in harm's way, prepared to die so that we may rest secured at home. They are the insurance policy that guarantees that our founding documents, our God-given rights, are more worthy than their own tomorrows. When the news that Falkenberg, Sims, Madison, and Iwan had fallen, the reaction, the shock, the disbelief, the grief, it was transformed into resolve and rage to complete the mission assigned to us and give us even greater tenacity under fire. Their sacrifice gave us clear focus to fight using a reserve that we never knew we had. We broke the will of our adversaries. The enemy was defeated. And because of that, we came home. For the infantrymen in combat, there is nobility and purpose in our lives, and that is unique. But we don't see ourselves as a people apart. We are America's warrior class. We are citizens of the United States and treasure this land more than any overseas posting. The Army provided me with purpose and appreciation for the blessing America has bestowed upon us all. I am forever grateful to the United States Army for making me able to count and cherish those blessings in a way that is unique to most and to those who you, the, you wear the uniform. I think the uniform, I think my Army has made us all better men, fathers, employees, husbands, and citizens. The controversy that swirled over the Iraq war was not a departure from other wars that America has fought. Just a short distance from where I grew up in Orleans County, on the Canadian side of the Niagara River, it was settled by loyalists who supported King George. With the exception of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, open dissent has been at the core of our very being and war has never been particularly a popular undertaking. American soldiers have never confused the United States with Sparta. The best leaders in battle become that way by being loyal and dutiful subordinates. We don't get a vote. We execute the lawful intent of our government. There is no political affiliation on our dog tags. We continue the warrior legacy of the United States without regard for adulation or unanimous approval either. The Iraqi veteran has maintained and in many circumstances far exceeded the highest traditions of military service to this great nation. Of the 1.5 million men and women who have served in Iraq, the valor they displayed was often subsumed by political rhetoric at home. But that in no way diminishes the accomplishment of our troops or the accomplishments of my generation at war. The award is recognition of that, and it should be seen as a validation of our efforts, not as a reward for the action of one individual in one house in Fallujah. When I think of Iraq, I think of Colin Fitz, man shot th by three separate weapon systems. Nobody would have raised an eyebrow if Fitzy retired. Instead, Colin Fitz returns to combat duty for two more years to shed more blood for this nation that he loves. 
When I think of Iraq, I think of Chris Oley, the young saw gunner whose job it is to open doors and put down f reflexive fire to people who happen to be shooting back at him. And he was able to do that because behind him was Sergeant Warren Misa, ready to pull him out of that doorway and undoubtedly save his life. I have Chuck Knapp, my team leader. Chuck Knapp saved our entire third platoon, Alpha Company 2-2, when he stopped us from entering a building contained IED that would have killed all of us. I think about Max Field, my saw gunner, who asked our Doc Abernathy to fix his injured foot in the prone position so he could continue to knock down targets under fire while he was getting fixed up. My guy, John Ruiz, who shielded the body of his buddy from incoming fire without fear of risk to himself. When I think of the Iraq war, I think of Piotr Saholis, brave, strong, and steady. Our engineers who devised and deployed remarkable weapon systems that saved countless lives. Our tankers, 27 cavalry on the other side of Fallujah that hardly gets any notice for what they did. There were indispensable Bradley crews who busted through walls. Omar Hardaway, James Cantrell, Chad Ellis, who without a functioning 25 millimeter Bush master, master cannon or tow or coax, and let's not discuss how that happened. <laughs> he used his rifle to suppress the enemy. Corey Brown, the grizzly bear from Montana. Shane Gossard, humble, beautiful, kind. Brad Utesayer, Delalu, the Bradley teams and those crews are the reason why children have fathers today. And those teams shielded our dismounts from rocket fire that were meant to take our lives. Corey McFadden, John Bandy, Wilson, Gary Fry, Kane. They never took a step backwards under fire. Sergeant John Gregory is one of the toughest, most decent men I've ever served with. He had a tour from hell a year after we came home. Our drivers, Marcotte, Gonzo, Woodbury, Hunter, Perez, they got us there, they needed where we needed to go and they did it with bravery and valor. Iraq makes me think of Victor Santos, a fiery brave soldier who cut his combat teeth at Iraq and went on for more in a Ranger regiment. McDaniel and Swanson, Young kids shouldering 240 Bravos on their shoulder, suppressing enemy fire from feet away. I had Stuckert, I had Metcalf, I had Flannery and Gross, and I had our door-crushing He-Man, Hugh Hall. That is my Iraq war. And it makes me proud to have told my dad no to dental school. I learned, <laughs> no. I learned much more from living and fighting with these men than I ever could have from a lifetime of doing root canals. <laughs> My unit's leaders died leading men from the front. When our company commander, Sean Sims, our company commander, he was killed in a house fight. Joey Seaford and my interpreter, Sammy, who just became a US citizen a week ago. Yeah, you can clap for that. Joey Seaford and my interpreter, Sammy, were there to engage the enemy in efforts to save my company commander's life. Seaford engaged the enemy and threw his weapon at him, engaging him with the buttstock of his rifle after being shot in the shoulder. Travis Barreto and my first platoon fought their way to extract wounded and fallen ramrods under intense enemy fire. My Iraq war I had Captain, now Colonel, Doug Walter. I had First Sergeant, Retired Command Sergeant Major Peter Smith. These were company leaders who put aside loss, put aside trauma, to direct young warriors during the most stressful times of our lives. Young lieutenants like Chris Walls, Jeff Emery, Lieutenant Menno, they learned how to lead and cover down when their peers had fallen. 
And finally, there's Scott Lawson, a true friend. We lost him in 2013. He entered the house with me that night in Fallujah. He gave me strength. He gave me confidence that allowed me to survive that night and many other nights since then. And I got to mention this guy, Michael Ware, a combat journalist there to cover a story and becomes part of the story. You know, before I got to know him, before I got to see him in action, I would have told you he was 100% worthless and a nuisance. <laughs> now that number is 65%. <laughs> I was wrong. Michael Ware is now the Ernie Pyle of his generation. His reporting is a testament to what we all did. And if it, it's not for men and women like Michael Ware, our story would have gone unremarked. Most of the men I just described got little or no recognition for their valor. In subsequent deployments, some would lose their lives years later. It is our duty to tell the story of our brave men and women who sacrificed so much for our fellow citizens. As I've tried to communicate to you today, this is not a celebration about me. I'm not mouthing a cliche. We have much more work to do when it comes to the Iraq war veteran. We are not there yet, and we're not even close when it comes to educating our fellow Americans about what was accomplished, what was sacrificed, and what we all went through. Our survival as a nation depends on it. We honor our brothers and sisters in the United States Marine Corps. Ambar Province was their fight. Men like Brad Castle, Rafael Peralta, Christopher Applesberger, Brian Shantosh, Jeremiah Workman, Sergeant Kraft, they gave the enemy everything they could handle. The Navy and Air Force completed the remarkable display of American valor and might and fought shoulder to shoulder in the, with the United States Army in Fallujah and all over Iraq. This entire military is one cohesive, dedicated force and the threats to our nations, they don't sleep. They're watching our every move. Iran, Russia, China, North Korea, ISIS, Al Qaeda. They may be watching this right now. Our military should not be mistaken for a cable news gab fest show. We don't care what you look like. We don't care who you voted for, who you worship, what you worship, who you love. It doesn't matter if your dad left you millions when he died or if he knew who your father was. We have been honed into a machine of lethal moving parts that you would be wise to avoid if you know what's good for you. We will not be intimidated. We will not back down. We've seen war. We don't want war. But if you want war with the United States of America, there's one thing I can promise you, so help me God. Someone else will raise your sons and daughters. We fight. We fight so our children never have to. We fight for one day when our children and our enemy's children can discuss their differences without fear or loathing. We fight so that anyone out there thinking about raising arms against our citizens or allies realize the futility of attrition against a disciplined, professional, and lethal force built to withstand anything you can dream of throwing at us. Americans want this kind of country. Americans want this kind of world. And we stand ready to defend it, to protect us. So help us, God. May God bless this beautiful army. May God bless our Marine Corps, our Navy, our Air Force and Coast Guard. May God bless our allies. And we already know that God blessed America because he gave us the greatest fighting force this world has ever seen, 2-2 Infantry of the 1st Infantry Division. <laughs> Thank you, Ramrods, Duty First, Dukes. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Staff Sergeant Bellavia. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and join in the singing of the Army song. The words to the Army song can be found in your program. March along, sing a song with the army of the free. Count the brave, count the true, who have fought to victory. We're the army and proud of our name. We're the army and proudly proclaim. First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might. And the army goes rolling along. Proud of all we have done, fighting till the battle's won, and the army goes rolling along. Then it's hi, hi, hey, the army's on its way. Count off the cadence loud and strong. For wherever we go, you will always know that the army goes rolling along. Ladies and gentlemen, Please pause for a moment at your seats to allow the official party and Staff Sergeant Bellavia's family to exit the auditorium. <laughs> 